Hi, everyone. Thanks very much to the um, G to Z team for in the invitation to speak today. It's quite overwhelming to speak to a, a big audience, or to me it is. Um, I'm not really into public speaking, but I had to um, grasp the opportunity that Nell offered because it's a really good, um, I think it's a really good opportunity cre to create some awareness of what occurs in our own backyard in terms of animal welfare in Indigenous communities. I'm not really used to speaking to an audience like this either. Whenever I present, it's usually to a small group of um, Indigenous councillors and the vibe is very different. I usually have to try to persuade them to believe in what I believe in and what we would believe in in this room, promoting animal welfare. Um, but it's generally not something that's a real priority in their mind, considering all the other cultural challenges that they have to consider in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and they would often fall asleep when I'm trying to present to them or talk about potential local laws that I'm encouraged to introduce, but um, hopefully you won't fall asleep. Um, so this is a good follow-on to Alison's presentation, and, and our presentations are not dissimilar, but there are dissimilarities to a degree. Um, so the welfare and control of companion animals, specifically dogs in Aboriginal communities, has long been recognised as a major concern. Um, there are various influ influencing factors that make this a complex and challenging issue um, and have contributed to its long-standing and ongoing nature. Um, remoteness of communities, cultural difference, financial constraints and a limited knowledge amongst Aboriginal people in regards to their responsibilities as pet owners and the requirements of their companion animals are amongst the contributing factors. So traditionally for, uh, for Aboriginal people, the dingo was a more independent companion, useful for hunting, um, suited to the harsh remote conditions uh, in, sorry, the harsh remote environment. Over the years, dingoes have gradually been replaced by European breeds or crossbred breeds and these animals seem to be much more dependent, prolific breeders, and are often more susceptible to sickness, to sickness in, and not necessarily adaptable to their environment. Um, the result of this is that we see overpopulation, malnourishment, and disease amongst the dog population. And sorry to uh, Sharon, I think, mentioned we don't want to see sad photos, but it's, it's sometimes difficult to avoid because there are some sad, sad situations. So the government's response to this um, need to implement animal control measures in Aboriginal communities and in particular in the Northern Territory has been disappointing and in fact detrimental. For many years Aboriginal people have endured ineffective, traumatic and culturally sensitive forms of animal control um, and governing bodies or so-called professionals have selected to implement cheap, quick fix options by coordinating generalised dog culls. It's been well documented worldwide that these approaches uh, achieve very short-term outcomes and repopulation occurs soon after. More importantly, this approach is hugely disrespectful to pet owners on both a personal and cultural level. In some Aboriginal communities in particular, amongst the Yungle people of East Arnhem Land, um, dogs are not only seen as companion animals and family members as they are in mainstream society, but also recognised for their cultural significance. Dogs play an important role in Dreamtime stories, uh, traditional song lines and dances are also dedicated to the dog. Many dogs are recognised as an important part of the family and identified within the fascinating and complex system of kinship. This means that if a dog's provided with a milk or a skin name, it identifies its connection to the people or family members within its family, but also other clan members stretching right across East Arnhem Land and beyond. Um, for example, due to a dog's name, a family member may identify that dog as their brother, sister or grandmother. Um, so with such a significant relationship um, between the dog and its family, it's not hard to understand that traditional forms of animal control in Aboriginal communities will, are now recognised as completely barbaric, culturally insensitive and not, in no way a means of promoting responsible ownership or empathy for animals. Um, 
Um, distressed owners would often watch on while their dogs were shot or euthanised um, with no understanding of what was going on or prior, to, prior consent. Uh, the dev devastation caused by this and the distrust has been instilled in communities and has made it extremely difficult to introduce any alternative form of animal health program, um, no matter how sensitive or thorough our um, community consultation is delivered. In the average community member, member's mind, any other vet coming to that community was just another one of that mob that came and killed my dog last time. This is a tragic reality of, of days gone by. So in terms of legislative responsibility, and the, the Northern Territory Government claims that the, um, well, the Northern Territory Local Government Act dictates that animal control is a direct legislative responsibility of local governments. Um, in the Northern Territory, there exists disparity amongst legisla legislation pertaining to dog management, um, and this has contributed to the, the challenge in achieving effective animal management. So animal welfare, feral animal control, and ex exotic diseases and dangerous dogs all legislation all come under different acts and are enforced by different um, authorities. So this has also contributed to a lot of inconsistencies. Um, but despite apparent responsibilities, unfortunately, financial constraints within local government bodies is considered an acceptable reason for local government bodies not to be able to acquit their responsibilities. So the result is that some shires have absolutely no means of animal control whatsoever, um, and others continue to uh, implement in inexpensive and sometimes ad hoc services. Our funding allocations are also at the discretion of local council, um, primarily consisted of an elected Indigenous council leaders um, with, with minimal understanding of their options for animal control or their, understa their understanding of animal management in communities, often poorly informed Indigenous councillors. Um, well, we can't expect them to make informed decisions based on, in regards to animal welfare control, given the other important day-to-day um, -day issues that they're faced with. Um, without the requirement to comply to legislation and without moral obligation to ensure that improved animal welfare and control and community health and safety is overseen, um, any change seems to be dependent on increased public awareness and public pressure to deliver improved services. Um, dis uh, discrepancies exist between funding opportunities in different states. Um, this too has seen inconsistencies in animal control outcomes Australia-wide. Uh, Queensland and Australia have been delivering effective dog health control programs, dog health and control programs in Aboriginal communities for 20 years. Sorry, for many years and often in some, some people's eyes they'd be seen to be about 20 years in front of the Northern Territory. Uh, this is largely due to the fact that dog health is rec recognised for its human and environmental impacts, hence gaining support through the um, environmental health departments and the uh, human health departments in these states. Uh, Northern Territory Government refuses to acknowledge the influence of dog health on human health, apparently based on a study that disproved the link between human scabies and canine scabies. Um, unfortunately, also in the Northern Territory, um, the health department is poorly funded, poorly funded, so not willing to um, support the funding of dog health programs. The outcome is that in the Northern Territory, um, animal control programs are the sole responsibility of local governments who are already struggling to deliver basic community services. So the outcome of this minimalist approach to animal welfare and control in the Northern Territory has resulted in substandard, yet somehow acceptable, acceptable levels of animal health and welfare. Varying degrees of overpopulation, malnourishment and disease exist amongst community dogs and this directly impacts the health, well-being and, health and well-being of community and their safety and di directly contributes to environmental impacts. Uh, with uncontrolled breeding amongst dogs, families are quickly overwhelmed um, with malnourished puppy, puppies and, that are often difficult to... Oh, sorry, and, and with exorbitant prices of commercial dog food in local stores, these puppies are often too expensive to feed appropriately. Limited access to health services and effective user-friendly medications means that they are also difficult to keep disease-free. Um, for example, just in this photo, 
you can see a three kilogram bag of dog food is twenty dollars and and this is a ridiculous price for an Aboriginal family to um, even consider even as a one-off let alone as a regular expense um, Malawash is often the uh, is a common parasite control um, that's found in local community stores um, and so it's quite a dangerous product to have in community stores it needs very strict dilution rates adhered to and for um, community members that have difficulty understanding volumes and dilution rates um, the risk for poisoning a dog is is huge. Um, so the result is that it's not only ex an, an awful existence for puppies, but with a home environment rapidly contaminated by faeces um, and parasites, humans, in particular babies, tend to be exposed to these parasites, such as ringworm, hookworm, tapeworm, various protozoal and bacterial infections. Um, in addition to this, as you can see from these photos, uh, many community dogs live with the constant dis discomfort of overwhelming tick and flea infestations um, and without access to effective treatments, owners too are in, uh, exposed to the disease risk and discomfort that these parasites cause. Although canine scabies has been, dis uh, has been proven to be a separate subspecies to the human scabies mite, and unable to breed on a human host, uh, it's been well documented to cause a transi sorry, transient infection, so creating irritation, redness and inflammation. Um, and in a recent study conducted by Dr uh, Rick Spears, um, he documented that 25% of people living in a household with a scabetic dog are actually exposed to transient scabies, which would resolve once the dog's treated. Um, so any parasite that causes skin sores in a human has the potential to result in secondary skin infections with streptococci and this often results in rheumatic, rheumatic fever and nephritis which are all, all too common amongst Indigenous Australians. Um, so with prohibitive costs of commercial dog food in community stores, most dogs rely on scavenging um, sharing the odd bit of food from a family member, eating the contents of random nappies sitting around the community, um, or learning the benefits of forming a pack and hunting together. The pack mentality, along with territorial aggression, which is very common in Aboriginal communities, leads to significant safety concerns um, for community members. In some communities, it's not uncommon for community members, both Yungwa and Ballander, Ballander being non-Indigenous people, to be scared to walk certain parts of the community. In response to this, many Ballander people walk the streets holding a stick, um, threatening any dog that approaches them. So unfortunately, this seems to only encourage a greater divide between um, dogs and people, creating you know, more fear amongst the people and um, very much disgruntled dogs. In some communities, cheekier, aggressive dogs have um, had such an impact on lifestyle that service providers such as health clinics and schools are having a lot of difficulty um, relocating new staff to communities. So obviously the, the um, dog health control picture is having a huge, huge impact on um, community services. Other welfare concerns for dogs in Aboriginal communities is the common occurrence of motor vehicle accidents and dog fight wounds uh, with limited animal health services, broken limbs and open infected wounds often go untreated. Other cause for concerns that are relatively common are transmissible venereal tumour, also known as TVT. It's a form of cancer that is spread du during mating. Um, the two examples on the bottom left below are TVT. Um, so with large populations that live in of entire and entire male and female dogs that live in close proximity in the community setting, we've seen um, TVT spread quite rapidly. Um, it's a disease of high mor mor morbidity yet relatively t low mortality, so it leaves dogs suffering for years with grossly enlarged genital regions and, and severe infections. Um, in more recent times, we're also seeing cutaneous or skin versions of this tumour, so suggesting that this tumour is also being spread through contact 
Um, there's not a lot known about its, its zoonotic potential, but this should not be dis dismissed either. Um, so this hopeless and uncontrolled picture of dog control in communities added to existing social and economical challenges also unfortunately results in violence towards dogs. Um, so dogs attempting to steal food from families or barking at a stranger walking through their property at night might easily find themselves a victim of a boiling water, a boiling water burn, a spear or a machete. Um, some injuries to dogs also seem to be a desperate form of reve revenge on a family. These are often knee-jerk reactions and with very, very little consideration or understanding of the pain that these, these injuries will inflict. So with greater awareness of animal-related issues in Aboriginal communities in recent times, there's been somewhat of a shift in the approach to um, animal welfare and control service delivery in Indigenous communities. Uh, this change has brought about a significant reduction in generalised culls, dramatically reducing the number of unnecessary euthanasias. So in 2010, the East Arnhem Shire Council accepted a proposal to change the approach to the way in which they were implementing animal welfare and control responsibilities. So with the employment of myself as their vet and animal control manager, um, which was at the same cost of previously delivered services, came the introduction of culturally sensitive, community-driven, sustainable and consistent animal health programs involving community education, local employment and training, and the development of an appropriate and acceptable approach to animal control legislation. So as indicated on the map, service delivery incorporates the nine remote Indigenous communities of East Arnhem Shire Council. So that includes Yakala, Gunyangara, Gapuyak, Ramanginning, Millingimbi, Gelawinku, Inurugu, Umbakumba and Miliakbara. Um, so this includes about 10,000 people and a recently estimated dog population of about 1,500 to 2,000 dogs just within East Arnhem Shire communities alone and covers approximately 35,000 square kilometres. Um, with most communities separated by hundreds of kilometres, sheer remoteness, oceans, rivers, poor road access, or flood conditions in the wet season, um, access is usually just by, via light aircraft. Um, although East Armshire jurisdiction is limited to the nine communities, with the dynamic nature of um, dog populations and disease, it um, makes a lot of sense to assist in service delivery to the surrounding outstations. So we extend our services to about 20 additional outstations or homelands in the region where services are otherwise non-existent. So the focus of East Arnhem Shire's animal health programs is surgical desexing and parasite control with additional basic health treatments supplied where possible and practical. Parasite control primarily includes use of ivermectin to treat and control scabies, ticks and intestinal worms. But in recent times with improved funding and some, and some sponsorship, we've been able to provide tick collars, worm tablets and some effective forms of flea control. Um, each community receives vet services three to five, three to five times per year with, um, sorry, three to four times per year with their duration going between three and five days depending on the requ requirements of the community. We now have a very strong focus on health promotion and population control through desexing rather than culling. So just to touch on some challenges of days gone by, um, in the first two years of the program, service delivery was really challenging. Fear from previous experience meant that community members were, were far from accepting of the program. Um, casual assistance were sought to assist in just day-to-day -day activities, but, um, and, and this would involve communicating with com community members as well as an extra pair of hands. But with minimal understanding of dog health, and a varying degree of numeracy and literacy sk skills and a fairly unpleasant work environment on offer, good assistance was really hard to find. Um, more often not, this meant working alone. Um, communication with community members or 
um, was quite confronting as a lone non-Indigenous person wandering around Aboriginal communities um, and somewhat challenging due to the language barriers, uh, as was the process of gaining permission, owner details and actually catching the dog, usually very little assistance from slightly wary owners. Uh, some photos here depict these situations, so, oh, sorry. Bottom right um, is a group of work for the doll guys that would usually not be exposed to this sort of training. Um, pretty overwhelmed, or not overwhelmed, but um, you know, quite a foreign experience for them to be clipping a dog. Um, the middle photo is with old Frank, who is a dog dreaming, dog dreaming man. He's always been a, a great assistant and a great friend. The day before he this photo was taken, he had a mild heart, or suspected heart attack and was in the clinic, but he was adamant that he wanted to continue working with me. Um, so I wasn't allowing him to lift any dogs. In this situation, we darted this dog and before it <coughs> lay down to fall asleep, it ran about 500 metres down a sandy beach that was inaccessible by vehicle. So um, it was probably about 30 kilogram dog and very difficult to carry back alone. Um, the photo down the bottom right is just a, a group of women from Umbacumba, very strong, intelligent women, but um, very reluctant to handle dogs and would come to work without shoes on, so not the most ideal assistance. Um, sometimes on school holidays, uh, I have the company of a group of school kids um, eager to help, which is always lovely and it's good to share the experience with them, but it's also important to keep an eye on what they're up to. Um, the top photo is me attempting to get details of a dog and, and you know, owner information from a young young or boy. His, um, his English would be quite limited. Uh, and the funny thing is often when I ask for information about the dog's name or the owner's name because I'm Bellander or non-Indigenous, they think that I want the Bellander, people's, Bellander name for people or Bellander name for the dog. So often they'll make it up on the spot and... I bring the dog back later and say, oh, he's Puppy or he's Milo or whatever name they've made up on the spot and no one knows what dog I'm talking about. So I quite quickly learnt that if I, if I want to know someone's real name, I need to ask, or the dog's real name, I need to ask them in Yungomata. So as soon as I ask the, the right question in Yungomata, I get, I get the right answer. So that's in, in the local language. Um, so cultural difference in general made my day-to-day -day work very challenging, but specifically in regards to animal suffering and euthanasia. Um, this is, or it was and it still is, one of the most challenging parts of my job. Um, so as a vet with a duty of care to alleviate suffering, um, this can be quite overwhelming. So often limiting options for surgery and treatment often results in the only practical um, way to alleviate pain and suffering is to offer, offer euthanasia. It's rarely accepted as most young or people um, would prefer their pets to pass naturally. The challenge in this situation is despite my concern for the animal's welfare and my duty of care as a vet, it's necessary to consider the bigger picture and the potential implications of my actions if I was to act against the owner's wishes. Um, so to force euthanasia of one animal would be hugely detrimental to the trust um, developed within the program. Um, it would quite quickly jeopardise the program and potentially, or the program in that community and potentially neighbouring communities because word spreads very quickly. Uh, trust that's, that has taken years to build up would be gone in an instant. Um, so it would most likely quick, quickly result also in dogs in that community being hidden or worse, worse um, the service not welcome back at all. Um, overall result would be that without services, many dogs would suffer. Hence the need to focus on the bigger picture and understand that our duty of care as a vet to alleviate suffering is important, but we also have a moral obligation as individuals to respect cultural difference. Uh, so from this, we've developed the approach um, that no permission means no euthanasia. Um, with the poor history of animal control programs and lack of awareness of their importance, um, the program and service delivery 
has really been seen as a priority amongst other shire staff and departments. Facilities to deliver services were orig originally less than ideal, usually a rundown, disused building, rarely with access to an acceptable water source. Thankfully, um, an easily sourced door and a couple of wheelie bins to form a surgery table of ideal height. Uh, vehicles were very scarce, making transport of dogs quite difficult. The environment proved to be an additional challenge with extremely hot and humid or hot and dusty work conditions, rarely a spare fan to provide relief. Uh, torrential rain in the wet season, incessant sand fires during parts of the year and the odd cheeky dog proving difficult and dangerous to interfere with. So some occupational health and safety hazards. Um, so some photos there, just um, old machinery shed as a work shed originally, uh, sorry, a workspace originally, just working under the shade of a tree, civil works yard surrounded by road signs. Um, two examples here that would possibly freak some vets out. This is a fairly contaminated old paint, paint sink um, that I was using as a surgery sink and a little tap that was on offer in another building. In this photo, we were relying on um, just natural light coming in from the door, but I think there was horizontal rain, so we had to pull the roller door down, and I was doing surgery by the light of my head torch while the, um, while the room flooded around us. I think we had some workers sweeping the water out. So early last year, East Arnhem Shire partnered with AMRIC, which was a bit of a godsend, uh, to deliver one of, few, uh, one of a few pilot animal management worker programs across the Northern Territory. So with funding through FAXIA, uh, AMRIC was able to provide us funding to support the, um, so to provide financial support for half of the salaries of 10 Indigenous an animal management workers and also fund five purpose-built animal management vehicles as well as training support from AMRIC staff. Uh, remaining expenses of the new program came from additional external grants as well as increased operational funds com contributed by East Arnhem Shire. So there are currently seven Indigenous animal management workers employed across East Arnhem Shire. Um, the position encompasses a community liaison role, dog health and control monitoring and data collection, delivery of basic animal health treatments, assistant, assistant during the animal health programs and vet services, and a conduit between community members and the vet. They're also big advocates for animal, animal awareness education. Um, so just some photos here of some of our animal management workers, uh, and it tends to attract both men and women. Some more photos here, um, mostly during surgery, so just Guys there are responsible for giving um, intraoperative treatments, uh, clipping, prepping the dog for surgery, um, into community travel, so going out to visit some outstations there on a light plane. Um, one shot there is an example of um, a poodle that's really inappropriate in an Indigenous community, so every three months he needs a clip. Um, and the guys there, Tony and Oscar, learning how to clip a dog and, and some very happy owners at the end of the, the haircut. So as part of the program, animal management workers receive non-accredited training. So this is basically just on the job training um, by myself when I'm there delivering vet services or also on the job training by sometimes a more competent animal management worker. Um, so on the job training is quite time consuming and we've probably gone from desexing between 12 and 15 dogs a day to now with, with all this additional training we'd possibly only get through two to four dogs a day. Um, but obviously an essential step towards creating something that's more sustainable. Um, they also receive regular uh, non-accredited training through AMRIC staff that come to communities to visit. As part of the program, as, or the employment program, they also receive accredited training through bachelor, so they're involved in uh, Certificate to Indigenous Environmental Health Studies, which incorporates animal health and control units. Um, in addition to, the, to this, um, sorry, in, in developing the program, initial recruitment of animal management workers and their preparation for employment was an extremely difficult and time-consuming process. 
Many animal management workers had never held a job before. Uh, their numeracy and literacy skills were extremely limited and they had either non-existent or very limited forms of identification to actually formally support their employment. Um, and in general, very limited understanding of work ethic. It was a rarity for an AMW to hold a driver's licence and obtaining one in a remote community was a bit of a nightmare. Um, animal management worker training not only revolved around animal related training but also significantly around lifestyle skills, work readiness and responsibility. So photos here show the animal management workers learning about some very basic lifestyle skills, learning about how to use a diary, planning things on a wall calendar, um, learning to maintain our most precious ve uh, asset, our vehicle, um, and learning to do some paperwork, so just some very basic skills. Um, so with the recruitment of animal management workers and the expansion of the program, it was necessary to provide more suitable work and safe work environments. So in the past 12 months, um, East Arnhemshire has sourced and funded the development of purpose-built animal management buildings in Gallowinku, Gapawiak, Ramanginning, Anirigu, Umbacumba and Millingimbi. So these buildings provide comfortable, safe and appropriate workspaces for the delivery of animal health programs, training and they also provide office space for animal management workers. Uh, so photos here show like a, a significant improvement in the conditions that we're working in. Um, so even stainless steel surgery tables, stainless steel sink, um, very comfortable air conditioned rooms. In Millingimby we're still uh, still some improvements to be had. This is our water supply, so just a portable esky and a wheelbarrow to catch the water. So still some improvements needed. Um, so here are some st just basic statistics of what's been achieved through the program over the past three years. Um, numbers, numbers don't really mean all that much in comparison to the impact that it's had on the communities. Um, so it's important to note here that numbers are a reflection of services provided to both Yungal and Ballandor non-Indigenous people. Um, other treatments refer to, the, to consultations or um, procedures done other than desexing. So this might be vaccinations, minor consultations or procedures, uh, limb amputations, those sort of things. Um, so although accurate data isn't really available because complete data hasn't been collected, there would be an average of about 85 to 90 per cent of dogs in the East Arnhem Shire jurisdiction now dissexed. Um, this is based or estimated based on some data collected by animal management workers in, their, in performing their community census, but also gauged on familiarity of the dog population in each community. Um, in the best controlled communities, the desexing rate would be closer to 95 to 100%, um, but approximately 80 to 80, 85% in the less controlled communities. Um, and results are often dependent on community size, accessibility, community compliance, performance of the animal management worker in that community, and also the influence of neighbouring communities, or outstations where services may not be existent. For example, we've noticed a regular slow influx of entire dogs into Ramanginning because it's... Um, because of neighbouring communities such as Manangrida where dog control is non-existent. Um, microchip was, microchipping is also um, incorporated into our service, so this is only for Indigenous owned dogs. Uh, this started a little bit later in the program um, and is going to form part of our registration system in years to come. So natural attrition occurs at a higher rate in Aboriginal communities than in mainstream society. Um, and with a dramatic decline in the number of puppies born, we're seeing slow, sustainable reduction in dog populations. Dogs are rarely euthanised, but when this does occur, it's usually for a very genuine, genuine concern regarding illness or potential spread of disease to family members, or when a cheeky dog is infrequently surrendered due to their aggressive behaviour. Um, data suggests that the number of dogs euthanised over the three-year period is approximately 10% of the total population. But amongst Yungal communities, the percentage would actually be much less, as this figure was blown out by euthanasias performed on Groot Island, where Anandili Auckland people went through an active phase of surrendering their pets for euthanasia. I found this quite a traumatic experience and um, found myself questioning community members as to why they were surrendering beautiful, well-behaved, healthy dogs 
I was informed at a later date that sadly an influential uh, source within the communities was pressuring community members to get rid of some of their dogs and surrender them during my visit. So obviously someone that was an, um, a believer in traditional forms of dog control. Um, without this, the euthanasia rate would be closer to 3 to 5%. Um, and, and this rate in comparison to years gone by, although I've not got access to figures, but when you hear about stories of, of many, many dogs euthanised, I'd say that the euthanasia rate might have been closer to 50 to 60%. Um, so dog health in East Armshire communities is generally much improved and we're experiencing an older, more mellow dog population. The prevalence of external parasites, specifically rabies and ticks, has de declined significantly. Some health clinics have claimed an anecdotal decline in the number of human scabies um, cases being treated, as Alison mentioned also. Um, better understanding of animal health and suffering and strengthened relationships between community members and the staff providing the animal health services has seen a slow improvement in owner responsibility. Um, this is a slight, there is a slightly more frequent occurrence of dogs surrendered for euthanasia, usually only for a very good reason. Uh, and in, in this setting, this suggests that people are starting to recognise suffering and having empathy to choose to alleviate this suffering. Uh, in cases where dogs are surrendered due to their aggression, we see this as a massive step towards owners recognising their responsibilities. Um, with the lack of replacement puppies, we're also witnessing owners becoming more committed to the dogs that are now living to an older age. So community education in regards to animal awareness and owner responsibility is crucial to the success of the program and a really important role for animal management workers. One-on-one -on -one education for all dog owners whose pets receive treatment, discussion of dog-related issues at community advisory board meetings and general community meetings, community advertisements through posters and newspaper articles have all contributed to creating uh, improvements in awareness. AMRIC education officers have also been involved in the delivery of animal awareness educations at the school and often, and these days, also incorporating animal management workers in the delivery of these sessions and upskilling them um, to be able to deliver these sessions independently. This education provides the foundation to ensuring improved animal welfare and greater empathy for animals in Indigenous communities into the future. So despite the improvements that we've achieved through the current program, there is still a need to move towards normalising animal management and control in Aboriginal communities through the development of appropriate policy and legislation. Um, this too is seen as a local government responsi responsibility and is essential in providing framework for service delivery and encouraging broader community compliance. East Arnhemshire Council has developed an animal welfare and control working group that consists of representatives of our elected Indigenous Council um, and extensive consultation with this group as well as all other councillors, uh, community advisory boards and various individuals who have cultural authority um, in relation to dog dreaming um, have led to the development of a few focuses for future local laws. So dog registration system, a process of ad addressing dangerous dog issues and mandatory sterilisation of restricted breeds are amongst those considered. And it's an anticipated that these three focuses will start to address some of the most important concepts or challenges that we have to address in Aboriginal communities. Um, Bring me out. I didn't see, I only saw zero. Sorry, I was out. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so I'll be quick. Uh, so, given the nature of the environment in East Arnhem Land, it's not uncommon for contractors who are attracted to the work in that area to bring with them their hunting, their pig hunting dogs. Um, and in, it's rare also that the houses that go with their employment are fenced. Um, so, it's quite common to have these sort of dogs roaming the community. Um, and, and this is a huge concern for their contribution, then entire pig hunting dogs breeding with local camp dogs and dingoes. So the potential for the nature of the camp dog to, to change significantly. Um, there's a few examples here, um, just bottom right, 
is one of our communities where a couple left in a hurry, um, leaving or abandoning three entire uh, hunting dogs. These dogs got pretty sick of being in their yard. They escaped the yard and they spent two weeks roaming the community. So it's not surprising that these sort of dogs, like on the, the right, that large dog is a entire male Great Dane, so most likely bred with camp dogs and dingoes. So something to expect in the future is dingo Great Dane crossbreeds wandering the outskirts of Ramanginning. So um, huge concern for that in the future, and that sort of animal would be a, a um, you know, the ideal hunting hunting breed. Um, yeah, a couple of examples there. So until we um, actually are able to implement local laws, we're really um, trying to promote positive reinforcement by rewarding people doing the right thing. So we've developed the Responsible Owner Award, um, which is a $25 voucher for the local store and a bag of dog food for owners that, on, during a vet visit that I recognise as doing the right thing. Most of these situations is people that have gone out of their way to track me down to dissect a, a litter of pups prior to them going to an outstation um, where they know there'll be no services, so they get rewarded for that. Um, just to touch on the budget, I've run out of time, so um, just a very significant change in the finances that have been contributed to the program over the years, over the, the last few years. Um, so East Arnhem Shire's contribution has significantly changed, going from around a $200,000 contribution to now around a half a million contribution. Um, this is very much to do with the fact that because of the development of the program, um, there's been more charges to actually recognise what goes into the program and program support. So um, greater contribution from them. Also a huge contribution from AMRIC in the la last couple of years. So $290,000 from AMRIC towards our animal management worker program um, and also additional funding bodies that support mostly the employment program. Uh, just touching on some of the significant um, components of the budget, so salaries, we've now got, we don't have 12 staff, we've got allocation for 12 staff, um, which are, is 6.7 full-time equivalents. Airfare travel is a huge um, component of the budget uh, because of the remoteness. Uh, vehicle lease, now that we have five, five vehicles to cover. Building allocations, that's a significant change in the last couple of years now that we have five additional buildings to... Um, to cover the cost of um, materials for general uh, veterinary supri supplies and, and some equipment considerations to, to furnish our new buildings. So remaining challenges, public perception is often, is often a huge concern. Um, new uh, non-Indigenous people coming to communities often see um, animal welfare and control as a, as a um, concern in communities, but often without due con due consideration to what is actually going on and the com complexities of the issue. Um, and often f uh, lodging complaints can actually be more detrimental to the, to the program. Uh, complaints lodged to, to government tend to often result in a knee-jerk reaction to action the complaint and, and there's a fear of, of them reverting to quick fix um, options of days gone by. I might just skip that. Funding, funding is always a concern, as, as a lot of people have mentioned, um, for the ongoing longevity of the program. Um, and animal welfare, despite all our achievements, just as in main, mainstream society, we always have concerns of cruelty and animal welfare, but I think it'll be generational change and consistent uh, animal awareness education that will actually achieve, help us to achieve um, overcoming these issues. Um, I'm going to skip them. So lo local laws for animal control is something for us to consider in the near future, but they really need to be implemented um, appropriately, given the nature of communities and the setting of remote Aboriginal communities. So. Um, culturally sensitive and respect, respectful approach, community education for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, um, local employment and training and appropriate legislation 
are all really important components for a successful and sustainable animal management program in Indigenous communities. So we're improving health and welfare of companion animals, avoiding unnecessary culling and promoting community health and wellbeing and safety. There's just some happy photos of community members and employees there. Thank you.